good afternoon, and thank you for tuning in to Everything by Faith. I will be your host today, Bryce Pico, and we are coming to you live. Uh, please forgive the inconvenience. Rachel was not able to join us. I know many of you were hoping to have lunch with Rachel, but we had to make a last-minute change. Hopefully, we will do this again soon where both of us will be here, or you will get the chance to see Rachel go solo. But today, we're going to talk about faith, picking up where we left off last week. Uh, if you've been tuning in the past couple of weeks, we've been starting at 7 o'clock in the evening. Uh, today we decided to shift to noon for convenience of scheduling. Hopefully this works out well for you. If you do miss this or you don't have time to finish watching this today, you can go back and watch on Facebook later. They, they will be archived for a time, and eventually we hope to upload them to our YouTube channel. So go to YouTube, look up Life Abundant Ministries. Uh, go to our channel. We have videos there from our Fearless Conference this summer and also a number of other short videos that you might find encouraging or helpful. Uh, today we're going to start in Hebrews 11, and we're going to read from verse 1. But before we do that, let's pray. Thank you, Father, for this opportunity to share your word. Thank you for your Holy Spirit that guides us. Thank you for your Son that gives us his name and his authority. Thank you for giving us all the good things you have for us, including wisdom and understanding. Give us eyes to see, ears to hear, and hearts to understand your word. And we thank you for these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Okay, Hebrews 11.1. 1. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. This is where we've launched off pretty much the last three weeks. And we wanted you to understand that faith is vitally important to your life. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. Now, God made everything not from nothing, but rather from faith. And he did it by adding his word to it. Uh, verse 3 of chapter 11 says, Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. So even though you may not see faith, or may not experience faith physically, you do experience it spiritually. That's where it comes from. And where it comes from is the spirit on the inside of you. See, if you made Jesus Lord, you have a new spirit. Let's go to 2 Corinthians 5. And we'll learn what happened to us when we got born again. See, before you got born again, you had an old dead spirit that was separated from God. And it wasn't protected from all the attacks of the devil. But when we're born again, we're given a new spirit. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, born again, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And one of the things that becomes new is your spirit. And within your spirit is faith. Let's go to Galatians 5 really quickly. So you can see all the things that come with your new spirit. If you're watching this live, try to keep up. If uh, you want to watch this later, you can pause the video. We're going to be moving a lot through the Bible today. So Galatians 5, verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. Now, in life, as you face challenges, maybe you thought to yourself, I just don't have enough faith, or I need more faith. And people often ask God up there to shower down faith upon them or give them more faith. Well, all the faith you will ever need is on the inside of you if you're born again. You are drawing faith from the Holy Spirit through your born-again spirit out to ca capture your words. So that's where you're getting faith from. If you're asking for more faith, don't ask for it from out here somewhere. Ask for it from in here. We need to be more God inside minded and think about the God that lives on the inside of us through the Holy Spirit. Now, how does faith come? I'm glad you asked. Let's go to Romans 10. And this is part of the uh, chapter where we learn how to become born again. If you've ever wondered, how do I make Jesus Lord? Well, let's learn together. Okay, Romans 10. Let's start at verse 8. But what saith it? The word is nigh thee. <coughs> Excuse me. What saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, 
and shalt believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. That sets the stage for this scripture. Verse 17, chapter 10. So then, faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. It doesn't come by heard. It comes by hearing, and hearing, and hearing. And you're not necessarily using your ears out here. You're using your ears in here, the ears of your spirit man. Once you get born again, your spirit's renewed, and now, with faith on the inside of you, you capture that with your spiritual ears, and it implants in your heart and impregnates your spirit through faith. And then that word begins to germinate, and whatever thing is inside that word begins to grow. You may not realize this, but words are containers. They carry the meaning of the thing they're meant to describe. When I say the word tree, you don't think of T-R-E-E. You think of a towering maple or a fir or some other kind of tree. You picture something in your mind. So the word tree carries with it an image. Much in the same way, words, especially the Word of God, carries within it the image of the thing it's trying to describe. And when you plant that down on the inside of your faith, the substance of things not seen or the evidence of things not seen, you begin to have that vision on the inside of you, and it begins to take root in your faith and grow. And when it comes out of your mouth, you're declaring it to your, your spiritual ears, and it's going back down into your faith. And that's how you keep the growth cycle going, much like farming. Farmers don't plant the seed just once. They plant it in the spring with the expectation of a harvest in the fall. Or in the case of winter wheat, they plant in the late summer or fall with the expectation of a harvest the next summer. They don't just do it once. They do it again and again and again. And there's crop rotation. So you plant one seed for one thing. If you want wheat, you plant wheat. If you want corn, you plant corn. If you want beans, you plant beans. Any farmer knows that. You can't plant wheat and expect to get beans. So it's important to choose the right words to say to your own faith. Now, we need to know why faith is important. This seems like very, very deep stuff, very spiritual stuff. How is this going to help us on a practical level in our everyday lives? Well, we're not out there just bumping through life like a frog hopping along the ground. We have a purpose, and we have direction. There's a plan put on our lives by God, and we need to know that what that is. Once we get born again, we're not just going to sit on our hands and wait for heaven to come. We're not just going to count out the clock until the game's over and go to be with the Lord. You can do that. That's okay. That's a great reward. But God formed you in your belly with a purpose. Before your mother even knew you, God knew you. You may have been an accident, you've been told, but let me tell you, you weren't an accident. God has plans for you, and there are things that only you can carry out. And in order to do that, you need to have the faith on the inside of your spirit and the Word of God to make those things come to pass. You see, the world system is not designed to help you pursue God. It's doing everything it can to turn you away from God. There are a lot of well-meaning people out there, teachers, business people, bankers, whomever, who want the best for you, but at the same time, they're going by the world system of doing things. God has the solution for everything. Let's go to Proverbs 4. Jump back into the Old Testament for a moment. And what we need from God is wisdom. Wisdom is God's, uh, I guess it's, a, it's, a, guess it's his operating system is the best way to say it. If you don't know what to do, you don't know the words to say to get the situation that you're in to change, you need wisdom. See, a kingdom is the realm of a king. Whatever, whatever the king owns is within his domain, and he has control over that. That's his king domain. That's his kingdom. It's very much the same with wisdom. God is the wise one. He's the righteous one. He made everything. He knows how it works. So in order to operate properly, we need to know the domain of the wise, how things operate inside that domain, and that's wisdom. So Proverbs 4, starting in verse 7. Wisdom is the principal thing. 
Therefore, get wisdom, and with all thy getting, get understanding. So before we do anything, once we're born again, before we approach any task, any relationship, any business deal, whatever the case may be, we need to get wisdom. The world has trained us up to react, to just react right away. And a lot of times it's a defensive mechanism. You'll notice often in your own dealings when people are confronted, they immediately start backpedaling and defending themselves. And it's, uh, well, I didn't know, or so-and-so did this, or so-and-so did that. Well, here's how we circumvent that system. If somebody does something wrong or if something's broken or you need to find out something, you can calmly approach somebody and say, look, you're not in trouble. I'm not here to cast blame. I forgive whoever did this. Now, please tell me how this happened so I can go about figuring out how to fix it. Because once you start figuring out the process of how things were undone, you can get wisdom from the Lord to make sure things are done the right way. And when someone is forgiven, they are taken back in time to the point before they committed the wrong. They are treated as if they were righteous, as if they were doing things right the entire time. And you can go back over the process of teaching a person to do it the right way. It's effective with children. It's effective with adults. Children tend to shift gears pretty quickly. Adults have a lot more ingrained training from the world system of there's only so much to go around. You need to protect your own hide. Cast blame wherever you can. Sounds like the voice of the accuser, because it is. And that's what's in our unborn-again spirit. So we need to get our spirits born again so we have access to this wisdom. And we get it through the Holy Spirit. And with wisdom, we need to get understanding. And that's not a matter of, oh, I get that. It's a matter of submitting ourselves to that. See, when someone has an umbrella, in order for it to work properly, a person has to stand under it. Otherwise, that person will get wet in a rainstorm. So we need to understand or get under or submit ourselves to the wisdom. It's not mental assent. It's a spiritual choice, just like love. It's a decision we make. When we submit, it's a decision that we don't go back from. Because if we go back from it, then that wisdom no longer applies to us. It is outside of our domain. We need to get in the domain of the wise. So on that note, let's go back again to talking about how faith applies to our everyday life. Say we're facing a financial problem, a financial challenge, whatever the case may be. Maybe you've got bills coming up that you don't have the money to pay right away or there's some unforeseen expense, or maybe there's a, an attack on your finances, somebody files a lawsuit, whatever the case may be. You have to know that God is your provider first, and he's going to meet your needs. Now let's go to, to Matthew. And we're going to build a little bit of a word arsenal to plant in your faith. Matthew's in the New Testament, which I can't seem to figure out right now. Fingers don't fail me now. All right. Matthew 6. These scriptures are particularly important to Rachel and me because we put these on the little greeting cards at the tables of our wedding. We picked several scriptures that we thought were demonstrative of how we wanted to live our life, and along with the place settings, we put them on there. And this passage in Matthew was one of them. We didn't write the whole thing out. We just put the reference so people could go look it up on their own. It's good to give people homework. Okay. Starting in verse 25, this is Jesus speaking. Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what you shall eat or what you shall drink, nor yet for your body, what you shall put on, is not the life more than meat and the body than raiment. Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, neither do they gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are ye not much better than they? Which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit unto his stature? And why take ye thought... For raiment, consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, they toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you, that even Solomon all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothe the grass of the field, which today is, and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe ye, O ye of little faith? That doesn't necessarily mean little of amount, that means little of use. Therefore, take no thought saying, remember that phrase, take no thought saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink? Wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek, meaning people who don't have a relationship with God. 
For your heavenly Father knows that you have need of these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Therefore, take no thought for the morrow. For the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. What does this mean, take a thought? What does this mean of little faith? What does this mean, seek the kingdom? Seeking the kingdom and his righteousness, that's going to the king, finding out how he wants things done, and then doing them. Doing them. Get wisdom, get understanding. Find out the right way to do things, submit yourself to it, then do it. But what's all this talk about take no thought? How do we take thoughts? Well, you don't really have your own original thoughts. People may think, well, is that God, or is that the devil, or is that just me? See, your mind is made to process thoughts, and your will is the chooser, and your emotions are the feeler. And people, when they take a thought, they're soaring through a number of options. That's why the Lord didn't want people eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, because then they're lifted up to such a level that they can start looking at options instead of taking from the Spirit the right way to do things and just doing it. So here we are, thousands of years later, and when we are confronted with the flood of information that is available now, we are having to make choices. And people tend to do it in their mind, with their will active. And where are the thoughts coming from? If you're not born again, the thoughts are coming primarily from Satan. And if somebody can get the Word of God in there to change your mind and get you born again, believe Jesus Christ raised from the dead and confess Him Lord, then you shift over the other side, where you have words not coming from out here, not from television, not the Internet, not from people, not information coming in your eyes and ears, and even through your nose, smells can be very persuasive. If you, if you want to cut down on food and you smell blueberry muffins cooking, it, smell can work against you. But they're coming outside from the senses and going in your mind. Instead, when with Oregon spirit connected to the Holy Spirit, it's coming up out of our spirits into our mind. We're no longer outside in. We're inside out. How does one take a thought then? Taking it is grabbing it. As we talked about before, believe is an old English word that we don't use anymore. Well, we use believe, but we don't use the root word leave. Leave means to take hold of or to uh, hold dear in one's heart. When somebody leaved something, they grabbed hold of it with their heart. To believe is to be taken hold of or to, to take hold of that thought. We take a thought by saying, verse 31, take no thought saying, because the thought that Satan wanted to interject into those people was, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? Wherewithal shall we be clothed? They're thinking about the wrong things. See, we get off God's plans for our lives when we start thinking about how are we going to pay these bills? How am I going to get to work tomorrow? How am I going to solve this relationship problem? Uh, how are we going to buy groceries? On and on and on and on. We, we could go over a million examples, and our minds are constantly turning those things over, especially if we're taking in, in, in formation, as we've been trained by the world, from the outside. How we break that is becoming God inside minded. And the place we train ourselves in, with, well, how we train ourselves is with this word, with the word of God. We start with the Bible. When we read the Bible, we retrain our mind to start listening to the Spirit on the inside of us. Because the Spirit of God is not going to say anything contrary to this Word. The Word of God was written by people inspired by the Holy Spirit. Meaning, it was God breathed into them. Sure, they may have written in their own language and in a way people can understand. But the information they got was from the Spirit of God. Back then, it was anointed upon them. Now, we're anointed from within. We have the Holy Spirit working on the inside of us in our born-again spirit. So that's where we draw our information. We learn to recognize that voice by starting here, and as directed by the Holy Spirit, we can take scriptures and take thoughts by saying. How do we know that? Well, let's go to the uh, parable of the sower. Let's go to Mark 4. Why would saying words have any bearing on our faith? Okay, 
Mark 4. Let's start in verse 3. Very quickly, we'll read through the parable, and then we'll see what Jesus was trying to say with this. Hearken, behold, there went out a sower to sow, meaning somebody planting seed. And it came to pass, as he, as he sowed, some fell by the wayside, meaning the, the path by the side of the road, and the fowls of the air came and devoured it up. And some fell on stony ground, where it had not much earth, and immediately it sprang up, because it had no depth of earth. See, plants have to go down with a root system before they sprout up. If they don't go down, they go up almost immediately. But the root system is not strong enough to hold, nor is it strong enough to draw moisture, and that plant quickly withers when confronted by harsh sunlight. But when the sun was up, it was scorched, and because it had no root, it withered away. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no fruit. And other fell on good ground, and did yield fruit that sprang up and increased and brought forth some thirty, some sixty, and some an hundred fold. That's a pretty good yield. And Jesus said unto them, He that hath ears to hear, meaning our spiritual ears, let him hear. And when he was alone, they that were with him, with the twelve, asked him the parable. And he said unto them, Unto you is given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God. Seek ye first the kingdom. But unto them that are without, all these things are done in parables. See, people that are taking information from the outside in, people that are not connected to the Spirit, this just sounds like a nice, nice story to them. Oh, that's a nice story, Jesus. How cute. Well, I'm sure the kids love that. But people that are hearing in here, not out here, but in here, they're going to hear it differently. They're seeing with their spiritual eyes. You saw how we talked about words were containers of images. And you use your imagination to start seeing the evidence of things not seen. You don't see them here. You see them here. That seeing they may see and not perceive, and hearing that they may hear and not understand, lest any time they should be converted and their sins should be forgiven them. And he said unto them, Know ye not this parable? How then will ye know all parables? This is the single most important parable for Jesus to teach. If we don't get this, we're not going to get the rest of them. The sower soweth the word. Words are seeds. And what's the soil? The heart. The spirit, what's in the spirit, faith. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. Things hoped for are words. The substance that grabs hold of them in our spirit is faith. In order for things to grow in our spirit, for that vision to come up, for us to start realizing those things, to bring those out into reality, those God ideas on the inside of us, perhaps the, uh, a beautiful building, or a new business, or a solution to a social problem, or even the cure for a disease. All those things can start out on the inside of us through the Holy Spirit. Most of the time, people coming up with those, these ideas are getting them out of books, in their mind, from the outside world. They consult experts. They get together in communities. They compromise the idea and come out with something far less than maybe what had been intended. They don't always come up with the best solution. They come up with a good solution, but is it a God solution? You may have heard of George Washington Carver, the man that developed the peanut into a cash crop in the South in the late 19th century. He was shown by God in a vision how to take the peanut apart and how to put it back together. And through that, he came up with all these ideas to make the peanut profitable. At one time, it was a pesky weed. It was a legume that had no value. But when the, crop, when the soil was exhausted by, uh, by cotton farming, the peanut became a valuable piece of the crop rotation that people took, especially people who did not have the best land, and it became a cash crop in the South after cotton was no longer king. That was an idea that came up out of the inside of his born-again spirit. Now, in the moments we have remaining, let's talk about how this applies to us in daily life. Let's say we have a financial problem. Let's say we don't know how we're going to pay that bill. Maybe we've made all the calls to our debtors or to the debt collectors, and we've said, we don't have money this week. We have a paycheck coming next week. Or worse yet, I don't have a paycheck coming this week. Right now, there's a, there's a strike going on. United Auto Workers are on strike against General Motors, and a lot of people have missed their first paycheck. Bills don't stop coming due just because someone has missed a paycheck. Now these people are trying to figure out how to make ends meet. 
sure the union is giving them a stipend, but how long is that going to last? Not very long because it's far less than what they were making on the assembly line or whatever they were doing for General Motors. So in that situation, believers in Jesus Christ can go inside their spirit and get the solution. And they're usually led to somewhere in the world word to start. Let's go to Philippians. We'll go to Philippians 4. Now, the primary responsibility of the believer is to serve God, to do whatever God calls whenever he calls it to be done. That's what makes him Lord. If you're not willing to do what he asks you to do, then he's not your Lord. Simple enough. We show our love for God by doing what he says when he says that. That's what the Bible says. So let's go to Philippians 4. Starting in verse 12. This is Paul talking here. Paul was, has been through the ups and downs financially, socially, relationally. Very colorful life, but he did everything he could for God despite their circumstances. This is what he says in verse 12. I know both how to be abased and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I'm instructed both to be full and be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need, meaning not to complain about it, but to persevere through it. I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. So that means no matter what God's asking him to do, he's anointed to do it. But how is he going to get it done, especially if there's no paycheck coming in? There's bills to pay. Let's be honest. Let's go to verse 19. But my God, and this is Paul telling people in Philippi that his God shall meet their needs. My God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. You're facing a need. The need seems insurmountable. What do we then do? We go to the scripture. We read it. But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Not just anybody's God. Paul's God. The Apostle Paul. The heavy hitter of the New Testament. Paul's God shall supply all my need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. You can say my God. That's okay. I like saying Paul's God or the name of someone who is very successful, who is a believer, who has flowed in the Spirit and become very profitable and prosperous, which the Bible says we can do, I say their name and their God shall supply all my need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Not according to my need, not according to the amount on the bill, but according to his riches and glory. A power that we cannot possibly exhaust. Do you think God who made the the earth and universe and everything in it has a lot on hand to help out with our little needs? You bet. So we take this and we start saying it. We say it out of our mouth, into our ears, into our spiritual ears, and into our heart, and it begins to take root. How does that work? Let's go to Mark 11 really quick while we wrap this up, and we'll see. And While we're turning there, remember how we take thoughts. We take thoughts saying, we can take the world's words or Satan's words that you're going to go bankrupt or you're not going to be able to pay this bill or your car is going to be repossessed or you're going to be out on the street or you're not going to be able to afford groceries for your kids and they're going to be malnourished. All these thoughts run through somebody's mind late at night and all throughout the day. The pressure is on and it's words from outside becoming thoughts. Now, if they start confessing those thoughts, saying the same thing as their thoughts, they take those down into their faith And those things become thorns and thistles, worries and cares of the world that choke out the word of God. And what's the word of God? My God shall supply all my needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. He can meet the need and then some. Mark 11, verse 22. Jesus answering said unto them, have faith in God or have the God kind of faith. For verily I say unto you that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, the mountain of debt, the mountain of sickness, the mountain of depression, the mountain of addiction, whatever the case may be, be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, meaning choking those words out with the words of the world, but shall believe, take hold, that those things which he says shall come to pass, he shall have, shall have whatsoever he says. Not just the word of God, if you start speaking failure and doom and gloom and despair, 
You can have those, and you take those with your heart when you say those out of your mouth. The Word of God has got to be bigger in your mouth than the words of the world. Take no thought saying, don't say those words. Say these words, my God shall supply all my needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. You find similar scriptures that support that. Get a concordance. Go online. Find a resource where you can find scriptures about finances. If the, cur- if the problem is uh, physical, find scriptures about healing. If it's about depression, you find scriptures about being in your right mind. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind. That's a good one. It can apply to addiction. It can apply to any area of your life where you need a solution. You start saying those things with your mouth and putting them down in your heart. So when those thoughts come from other people and other sources, they don't overwhelm the Word of God in you. And it takes root like a good, strong, tall tree. You won't be pushed over in a storm. So that's how you take the Word of God. Plant it in faith. Have it grow up on the inside of you. And you will persevere those storms until the provision comes. And you will be prosperous. Third John 2. Last scripture, I promise. I want to thank you for being with us today. Again, please forgive the scheduling change. We really appreciate you tuning in today, and we hope this has been a blessing to you. Third John, short little book. You could probably read this in less than five minutes. Verse 2. Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health, even as thy soul prospers. Your soul prospers when the faith in your spirit takes hold of the word, takes root, comes up, and renews your mind, and solidifies your will, and settles your emotions. And you'll be rooted and grounded firmly in love. And whatever God tells you to do, you can do it by faith. Thanks again for tuning in today. We hope this has been a blessing to you. Uh, Continue to visit our website at www.life-abundant.org. We have a lot of free resources on there you can use. Learn about how you can join this ministry as a partner and prayerfully uh, think about how you can support this ministry financially and get involved with what we're doing here. We've got a lot of great things coming up, including Everything by Faith. We're going to be publishing some full-length books, hopefully, in the near future. Also, if you think we'd be a benefit to your church, Bible study, or other organization, contact us. Fill out the inquiry form. We'll get back to you. We'd love to come and uh, minister to you where you're at and uh, help hopefully be a blessing to you and strengthen your faith. Thanks again and have a great day.